Okay. Okay, I'm going to be talking to you about the development and validation of a single snapshot multiplex for identifying tiger species and subspecies and the implications for forensic purposes. I'm just going to go through a wee bit of background as to what's going on with the tigers at the moment and why this is important. So, uh, the tiger is currently listed on Appendix 1 of CITES and there are currently nine subspecies recognised. Um, three of which are extinct and one of which, the Amor tiger, um, only lives in captivity. All of the five subspecies of tiger are critically endangered and in the 1900s it was an estimated population size of around 100,000 and now we're down to around 300,000, no, 3,200. Um, legal treating of body parts is increasing, um, such bone, whiskers, teeth, Skin, anything that they can get their hands on. Um, and the high demand is particularly for bone for traditional Chinese medicine. Um, the illegal trade is in fact so big that in 2009, Robert Zolik of the World Bank, he's the chief, said that the black market in global wildlife products was around $10 billion, which after drugs and weapons is the most valuable illicit trade. Um, international trade of tigers and parts are forbidden by CITES, anyone that has signed up to CITES, um, and there are also national legislation preventing the ownership of body parts. Um, forensics is used in determining if a seized material contains traces of illicit tiger or anything else that is illegal um, by the above laws. and. Morphology can help identify skin and large bones, but when you've got it down to little bones and tiny traces, genetic data is a lot easier. Okay. So, why are we doing this? Currently, there are very few methods that are able to sufficiently test for subspecies. Um, and we also need to be able to detect, detect small amounts of tiger bone um, or other types of the tiger in medicines and things like that. So, the objectives for this experiment was to develop a fully functional and validated forensic test for detecting t tiger species and subspecies. Um, this test was done before this experiment, but it was never actually validated for forensic use. Um, to, we need to create tests that can distinguish between two particular tiger subspecies. It's all well and fair enough if it says, yep, you've got tiger subspecies here, but it doesn't actually tell us which ones they are. Um, we need to be able to determine the presence of small quantities um, of possibly treated um, tiger material in medicines. And we also need to demonstrate the development and the final validation of this test. So, what genetic material should we use? Um, nuclear DNA is often degraded, um, possibly because the samples are old or because they've been treated and put into medicines. So, we use mitochondrial DNA. It's um, a lot stronger circular structure, so it can withstand changing environmental conditions. Um, and there are also around 100 to 10,000 copies per cell, which means you can get a lot of DNA from a very small amount. Um, we are, normally tiger species are um, identified when using PCR of there we go, of um, those that are shown in green. Um, but for this experiment, we are going to identify species and subspecies with the um, elements shown in red. The method is quite complicated, so I've tried to cut them down a wee bit. But we got 15 tiger samples, hair and tissue. The hair was stored at room temperature and the tissue was stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. And they were obtained from different unrelated individuals. Um, and previously, so before the whole experiment took place, they were identified as four, number, four Sumatran tigers, four Bengal tigers, um, five Siberian tigers, and two Indo-Chinese tigers. Uh, the DNA extraction was carried out and the samples were stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius.
to identify the species specific and subspecies specific SMPs. We sequence eight samples from two of, um, two of each subspecies, um, the mitochondrial genome was sequenced. Um, then the eight sequences were combined with 492 samples from Gene Bank, um, and these were all aligned using a Clustal X2 program, which I'll show you the example of after this slide. Um, the variability between the species um, was then looked at on from the Clustal product, I suppose, um, and the variation was determined. Um, and then the SMPs that were specific to a particular subspecies were recorded. So here we've got an example of the output of Clustal X. Looks quite complicated, not too bad. This one uses amino acid bases, um, as we're using sort of base pairs, so guanine, cytosine, things like that. But you can fairly easily tell what sections are different between species. And you, that is how you would define where the species significant SMPs were compared to ones that weren't species significant. Um, the tiger species specific SMPs were identified. Um, this was using, uh, again, an alignment of 349 sequences of cytochrome B genes combined with um, 71 tiger sequences, so the 349 were different animals, no tigers, and then 71 tiger species were put in with this. A haplotype, which is a combination of alleles that are located closely together on the same chromosome, of five tiger SMPs were identified um, that were specific to all tiger subspecies and not present in any other animals. However, some animals did have one or two of the SMPs, but none of the animals had all five. Um, once they were identified, primer pairs were designed to amplify the regions, and to ensure successful amplification, we ran a small amount of the PCR product on an agarose gel, um, and then the remaining product was purified. So the main part of this experiment was the snapshot multiplex reaction. The snapshot multiplex is um, an assay that simultaneously measures multiple target samples um, in one run or cycle of the assay. So if you've got, if even if you had a bear, musk, and a tiger, you should be able to identify all of those types in one run of this assay. Um, the multiplex system is able to confirm and screen SMPs, which is part of the reason why we're using it. Um, 11 snapshot primers were designed to bind the adjacent SMPs on forward or reverse direction. The singleplex and multiplex reactions were then carried out and the products were amplified and purified. These were then separated by capillary electrophoresis. Here's a wee example. It works just by putting the sample into this end. It runs through the tube and to identify what you have in your sample, a light is shown through one side and then it is picked up by, well that looks like an eyeball, probably not an eyeball, <laughs> a computer, um, <laughs> by some kind of detection um, and it recognises the amount of light that's coming through the tube and it can tell you what the molecules are. So we needed to, the whole point was to validate this for forensic use as it has been used before. So for accuracy, uh, 10 of 15 Voucher Tiger samples were picked at random and the average range and size of fragment peaks and the standard deviations were calculated. The sensitivity um, for the PT Corvetti, um, copy numbers of the mitochondrial genome were diluted to around five different concentrations and they were analysed by the assay. For specificity, specific, specificity? You know what I mean. 14 <laughs> other mammal samples were used to test the assay. And then in blind trials, there were 293 samples, and a total which consider, consisted of big cats, other mammals, and tiger samples. Um, 10 were taken at random and they were tested. So, our results showed that there were six tiger subspecies specific. SNPs, a lot of S's, 
um, were identified on three gene loci of ND2, ND6 and cytochrome B. Um, five out of six of the SMPs that corresponded to those, a previous study on tiger subspecies specific SNAPs and five out of six of ours corresponded with that previous study. Um, three of the six were specific to the Sumatran tiger and the rest were specific to PT tigers. Um, we couldn't identify any specific SNAPs to the Siberian tiger or Corbett's tiger. Um, five SMPs were species specific, so just for tigers alone. Um, and the application of the mitochondrial regions surrounding the SMPs was successful. SMP typing of the four tiger subspecies corresponded to the expected results. However, the fluorescent dye that was added did increase the mass slightly, um, but it still gave us a pretty good result. Here's an example of, I think it's quite a good one actually. Um, you can see the ones that are tiger specific. They all look pretty much the same. And then we can see the differences between the tigers and the Sumatra tiger. Um, I think it's quite, quite an easy way that you can see how the SMPs are different for each species. So, to validate our results, um, there was 100% accuracy for each sample, um, and it showed the expected SMP uh, that was predicted. The standard variations observed were very low, 0.18 to 0.55. Uh, the sensitivity of full SMP profile could be carried out from as little copies as 15,000, which is about 0.26 picograms, which is a very tiny amount. Um, and the PCR product that was amplified from the sample was also the lowest concentration of starting product that you can get a full profile from. Um, the specificity uh, one tiger and 14 mammal samples were tested in the assay and only a full tiger sample came out from all of those assays. However, we did get partial profiles from other big cats, um, but they were obviously different to the tigers, so that was okay. <laughs> and the blind trial test was 100% accuracy in categorizing the unknown samples. So, in conclusion, um, the subspecies ID, there's only a few bases that can distinguish between subspecies and here we've developed a valid test to test for these, um, which avoids us from using long, possibly de degraded samples of DNA. Um, it's fully valid and fully functional and allows one, more than one gene to be identified in one reaction. Um, we identified 11 tiger species and subspecies specific SMPs and we were able to use the snapshot multiplex assay to identify trace amounts of tiger material and to determine not only the species but also the subspecies. Um, however, there was a problem with the Corbett's tiger and the Siberian tiger with no specific SMPs but we were still able to obtain full profiles for those two. Um, and we were still able to determine that they were those species. They just don't have the specific SMPs. Um, I think that's me, really. Mm -hmm. Any Thank questions? You. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? So, um, I might have at the beginning, but did you define what an SMP was? No, I didn't. So do you want to explain to my okay. people who probably don't know what that means? It's a that? single nucleic, well, nuclear polymorphism. So in your genes, you will have small sequences, generally very small sequences of base pairs um, that will differ between species and subspecies. And that's what we used here. And um, so for the snapshot, what was the advantage of using that? Did they make that clear why that was better um, in their approach? The, well, I'm not really sure what other types of multiplex assays you get other than the snapshot. The snapshot was just, I think, the, the make of assay that they used. 
um, to identify the SNPs. There's quite a lot you can do with the system um, from sort of creating primers that add to the SNPs to sort of screening the, primers, screening the SNPs to see what they are. Um, but I'm not really sure what other techniques. I think it was just that was the type of system that they used that was the make of it. So. Any other questions? So, um, did you get a, a, an idea of whether this was going to be useful and accessible for conservation? Um, I think it's I, I think it's a little bit expensive at the moment. Um, it is useful, obviously with regards to the law aspect of actually persecuting people that are part of the illicit trade it doesn't really help because people have already done it. Um, but hopefully we should be able to figure out if we can figure out what species they are um, and possibly you can use the SNPs to see what population that they've come from. You can figure out what routes they're travelling to get to these places. So you can police the routes a lot more obviously you can't really stop people from doing it, but you can police the trade routes of how they get there so you can hopefully get them before they actually manage to be released into circulation. But there was actually a paper done by the Forensics Unit at Strathclyde University that um, measured, I think it was bear, musk, ox, tiger and another species in traditional Chinese medicines from Glasgow and Edinburgh and they found one of the samples actually had tiger bone in it which is, I thought was quite shocking considering we were in Glasgow you wouldn't really expect to find tiger bone in Glasgow, but <laughs> you do, so I think that there's a lot more work that needs doing on it and it needs to be a lot more, it needs to be cheaper, I think is the main issue. Thank you very much. <laughs>